from Isolation Studios, it's Richard Krauss. Welcome to In Isolation With, the talk show where we make a connection without actually making contact. I hope you're all doing well, staying safe, staying healthy, and staying home. My guest today is Kathy Reichs, a forensic anthropologist whose best-selling books are based on her real-life crime-solving exploits. As the author of the Temperance Brennan series of books, which inspired the television show Bones, she is one of the biggest-selling crime authors in the world. Her latest book, A Conspiracy of Bones, was released just as the pandemic struck. Her book tour was cancelled, and like so many of us, she went into self-isolation. She joins us today to talk about the book, its Canadian inspiration, and why Temperance Brennan has remained a popular character over the course of 19 books and 23 years. She joins us via Zoom from South Carolina. Now, I started by asking her how she's making out. Here's what she said. Well, I am in isolation with my two daughters and four grandkids. Oh, wow. But it's a big house. We're down at my beach house. I haven't left the house since, I don't know, sometime in the 1993, I think it was. So it's good. It's like communal. It is communal living. And I'm getting well, a lot of writing done. Well, good. I was going to ask you about that. You're in Charlotte, North Carolina now, are you? Is right now, I am on a barrier island off of Charleston, South Carolina. Right. Now, if you look out the window, do you see people on the beach? Do you see people social distancing? Do you see people doing all the things they're meant to do? No, the beaches are closed. Um, let me, it's a little confusing. The island is closed, but the beaches are open. So technically residents can go out on the beach, but right. nobody who's a non-resident is supposed to be coming onto the island. So the beaches are very, very empty. You can, you can see behind me, that's, my, that's a shot my daughter took of, of the beach here. You're in, you're in isolation. Uh, writing is a solitary job anyway. Uh, are you finding a, a great deal of difference in your day-to-day -day in terms of your life as a writer? Well, I have four grandkids here. <laughs> Normally I don't have when I'm at my home in Charlotte. What I do is I try to get up early and uh, the kids are in school all day. They're in virtual school. So they're pretty busy. They're with their moms um, on computer and doing lessons and doing Zoom with their teachers. So really we all are just going to work and going to school. We're just doing it at home. Now, how are the kids responding to this? Are they young enough that it seems kind of cool maybe to do it? Or are they bored teenagers that, are, <laughs> that have had enough of it already? Yeah, they range uh, from the, the oldest is nine, the youngest is four. Right. So they're middle, middle-sized kids. Um, and fortunately, we can take them out and run them on the beach. So, or put them on bicycles and have them, you know, go up and down the, the street in back of us. Um, they may be getting a little bit antsy, but um, so far so good. And, and they, they do, they are in school all day. It's amazing how much uh, distance learning uh, the parents are expected to do. I had to do it for three days. Uh, my daughter was gone. I had to do it for three days for the third grader. And it's like, I don't get this math. What? Uh, now, you were about to launch this book when all of this happened. You were booked to be on my television show here in, in Toronto. Uh, I'm sure speaking engagements press all over the place. So that all got wiped out. Uh, the book is out nonetheless. They, 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 they have released the book. Uh, but you did something cool, I thought, on your blog. You did a virtual book tour where you walked people through uh, your, your office. And I found it really fascinating. I always find it fascinating. One of the things I kind of love about a lot of what's happened now is we're seeing how people live more because they're broadcasting from their homes and that kind of thing. And uh, I found your office to be kind of whimsical. <laughs> there, there are lots of kind of interesting things. And I, and I wondered if it's because so often what you're writing about has a dark edge to it that you like to have these mood lighteners in the, in the room with you. It may be. And the, the art that I have in my office is quite different from what's in the rest of that house. Right. Yeah, there's uh, the, the giraffe that has all the bling. I love her. I got her from a gallery in Spain by an artist, Tom Strags, who's in Germany. Um, I've got another sculpture 
it's a very odd looking thing if you saw it. So I yeah, so, sometimes yeah. when I look up, I just like to look especially at the giraffe because she has these very long eyelashes and all this bling going on. I do, I like to just look up and it makes me smile. Can it be difficult to shut it off at the end of the day if you've spent a day writing about someone getting their face eaten off by a feral hog? Uh, is it difficult sometimes to let that go? Not really. And I think, it, you know, it's a skill I developed doing the actual work. When you would leave the forensic lab, the autopsy room or a crime scene or whatever, you know, you've got to be able to leave it behind and shut it off. So. And this book is partially, and I found this fascinating, I'm always looking for a little Canadian connection when I can. You've spent a great deal of time in Montreal and in Canada. Uh, but this book was partially inspired by a case that you worked on in Ottawa. Can you tell us a little bit about that without giving away anything that we shouldn't give away? Yeah, what I do is I take uh, from a case just some core idea, a nugget of an idea, and then I change it around. And in this case, I had worked on the a, a journalist was murdered and her body was thrown in the woods and it was scavenged by bears in that case. So that by the time she was found, it was months later and the scavenging, um, the body was in very bad shape. So I took that core idea of, uh, okay, what if we have a body scavenged by wild animals and then, you know, spin, ask myself, well, what if this and what if that, and then spin it off into, into fiction. I changed the bears to feral hogs because we do have those in North Carolina. Right. I've heard that writers often have like a, a drawer and they'll be like on the back of a matchbook or on a, on a sticky note, it'll say uh, feral pigs. And then you put it in the drawer and eventually if you're starting to feel a bit of a block, you just go through the drawer. Actually, I do. It's, uh, it's a folder. It's called Future Stories. And if I see a newspaper clipping or something, I'll cut it out and I'll put it in there. Or if I read an article in one of our professional journals uh, or see a presentation at one of our professional meetings, I'll you know maybe jot down some notes or photocopy the article and stick it in there. One of the themes that I, I thought was really interesting that was drawn out of this book is, uh, and this would not have existed really when you started writing these books in 1997, uh, but it, it's the idea that via blogs, information that we put out into the world isn't vetted. I mean, we people are pretty much free to say anything that they want, and it becomes difficult then to uh, separate fact from fiction, to know what's real. So we live in a time where we have phrases like, alternative facts and that kind of thing. You are a person of science. You are a person who has uh, always spent uh, a, a, what I imagine is a great deal of time to make sure that your books are accurate to the science that's involved in that kind of thing. Um, obviously, it's something that you're thinking about. It's on your mind, this new world that we live in. Is that where the idea from that came from? Is it something that concerns you? Yeah, absolutely. And you've put your finger on the theme of the book is how does the average reader or listener or viewer sort through all of that information and disinformation that's out there? Because as you say, anybody can put anything out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's fake news and what's real? And it doesn't just come from, you know, crackpot conspiracy theorists. It can come from people in authority. <laughs> so how do you know what is true and what is not true? And that is the theme of the book on two levels. Yes. Because Tempe is also having some issues, some health issues, and she's experiencing some migraine headaches and things like that. And at one point she loses all of her data. She's trying to get this faceless corpse identified. And all she has left to rely on is what's in her head. And for the first time ever, she can't fully trust her own perceptions. So how does she know what's real and what's not real on a personal level? And then on a broader societal level, that's also the theme of the story. And I guess that's where the quote from Virginia Woolf that begins the book, it is far harder to kill a phantom than a reality comes from. These ideas that these, or the idea that these fake ideas and, and things are just like phantoms that just exactly. that, that, that are around us and they're hard to get rid of. Once they're out there, you know, vaccination causes autism. Once that kind of thing is out there, how do you quash it? How much of, of temperance is based on you? You must draw 
from various elements of it to create this character that uh, people keep coming back to over and over again because I think she feels real. Uh, people have a relationship with her through your words. Uh, but is, is some of it personal for you? Well, some of it is. Um, the bar part about her having the cerebral aneurysm is, I mean, I was diagnosed with one a couple of years, several years ago, um, very serendipitously, no symptoms or anything. They were looking at something else and said, oh, by the way, you have this little bubble on your artery. It was corrected, no big deal. So I decided to share that with my character. Um, her casework, her professional life, obviously, were, were mirror images of each other, but she's got things in her personal life that are strictly her own, her contentious relationship with Andrew Ryan, you know, her daughter off in the, the army, that kind of thing. That's all Tempe. People also tell me we share the same sense of humor. Right. So I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep her evolving and changing? I mean, you've been, you've been writing about her since 1997. Um, there are not that many, just to my estimation anyway, there's not that many characters that have remained this popular. It's 19 books. It's, yeah. it's, it's you know, decades of, of work. How do you keep her fresh? Well, you have to, as you, you use the word, you have to keep her evolving. Um, in each book, she's got to be facing different challenges and addressing them in different ways. And that's the main storyline, of course, is always the murder. I write good old fashioned murder mysteries, thrillers. Um, so that's your main, and the bottom line of my books is a good story. So that's gotta be different in, in every book, but also she's gotta be facing personal challenges and meeting different ones in different books and evolving relationships with other people in in different books in the course of the series. As you say, it's a good old fashioned murder story. And Dateline is always in the top five uh, on the, the television ratings. We are fascinated by documentaries about uh, crime and true crime. What is it? What is it about that genre that appeals to us? Is it that we it's like, uh, I always often think about it, like going to see a scary movie. Like really, why would you want to go be scared, have that kind of oogie feeling that you get, but you go see it in a movie theater, a place where you're safe and you're seeing something kind of horrifying and it gets your endorphins going. I don't know if it's the same in, in books. Well, maybe you're vicariously experiencing this other world of evil that yeah. is fascinating uh, and yet, you don't really have to be in the autopsy room. You don't really have to be at the crime scene. And yet you can experience that. You can learn something about it. I think with my books, people like to learn a little something and uh, from the science. And they're different from traditional mysteries in that the solution is um, science driven. So in each of the books, I use a different kind of science. Um, and I, I'm committed to keeping it accurate um, because if people read about I don't know, blood spatter pattern analysis they, and think they've learned something, well, they have. Hopefully I've gotten it correct. You've got to keep it short and entertaining and jargon free, but hopefully um, it's, also, it's also correct. I think that's part of the appeal. I think the other part of the appeal of a murder mystery is, is trying to figure it out. It's like a puzzle. Can I figure out what happened and who done it? Um, who's the bad guy or girl uh, before the author tells me? And I know if I read a murder mystery and I figure it out before the end, um, I'm a little disappointed in the author because right. I like that twist. I like that, oh, I didn't see that coming at the end. You talk about the accuracy in your books. In the video, the virtual book tour, we see the bookshelf behind you and directly where you sit, from my estimation anyway, this is what it looked like to me. You've got your writing area and then you could just turn around and pick up a book on blood splatter uh, right away, so, <laughs> or, or whatever. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if people ever check my office, well, if people ever check the hard drive on my computer, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> One of the things we learn about in this book is the dark web, you know, so I spent time going down into the dark web and Did you? you know visiting sites that normally I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't visit. So the dark web, for people that don't know, is uh, a place where if you want to buy a human hand or uh, what, illegal drugs or whatever it might be, it's the place that you go. But it's not, well, what, what exactly is the dark web? Explain what it is. It, it's not just Google. It, you don't Google the dark web and end up over there. 
Well, that's the whole point is it's, it's the web, which is much larger than the normal surface web, the www. It's enormous, but it's not accessed by normal browsers. You've got to use a special browser to go, which anybody can download. It's, but you can't get there through Firefox or Safari or. Did you find anything there that you found truly shocking? Well, <laughs> it's hard to shock me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've done a lot of research on a lot of um, nasty topics, shall we say, for different books. And also, you know, working in a forensic lab and seeing that swirl around me all the time, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much aware of what humans can do to other humans. So it's pretty hard to shock me. What is your ratio of work, uh, maybe not right at this moment because uh, it's a it's a different world that we're in for the next who knows how long but in, in a regular day-to-day -day way uh between your work as an author and then your work as a as a forensic scientist well there came a point uh where i was writing an adult book every year temperance brennan i was writing a young adult book a tory brennan book the viral series i did six of those with my son and I was writing a screenplay for the show, for Bones. So there came a point where it was just too much and I had to give up something. So I'm not really doing any active forensic work anymore. I'm not going into a lab on a regular basis. I'm available if they need me, but yeah, so that much I'm, that part of me is, is done. Do you, do you miss it? I do, but you know, I was always kind of caught in this quandary if I was writing a book and I have a deadline for the book I'm, and then I get a call from the lab to come in I think well I don't have time for this but then if weeks would go by and I wouldn't get a call I think what the heck why why isn't the lab calling why don't I have any casework so I was never happy I guess. <laughs> uh, could you have imagined when you wrote Deja Dead uh, you started that in 1994 is that right you went around there? Yeah. So you started writing that book. Could you have imagined that all these years later, we would be sitting here talking about the new book in, in this series? You know, it crosses your mind. And then as a first time, completely unknown novelist, I'd never written any fiction. You, you know, then you'd say to yourself, well, come on, get real. You know, right. maybe you'll, you will finish this book, but maybe somebody will actually publish it. And then maybe somebody will actually read it and like it. Um, and that's really, that was my goal um, at that point. So I didn't, you know, it would cross my mind, but it, it didn't really seem like a reality that would take Well, place. you had written a couple of textbooks, which even you said, nobody read them, nobody bought them. The, my students did. You did. <laughs> yeah, and my colleagues, and you know, they were big in forensic anthropology, which is a very small market. So yeah, they did not make the New York Times lists or the Globe and Mail or anything. No, none of those. Yeah. Uh, so one last question, pandemic related, I guess. Uh, do you have any hand washing tips? You've got little kids in the house, you've got older people in the house. Uh, do, do you all sing happy birthday? Do you make sure that you clean your thumbs? Because that's apparently the part that a lot of people miss. Is there any tips you can give us? Gosh, I don't, I mean, I mean, I do all those things. You, you wash longer and you, you know, you do that thing where you scrape your fingernails. Yep. And I've also stopped wearing any rings, any jewelry on my hand. Because, you know, like your fingernails, you know, things can collect in there. So I've stopped doing that. I guess that would be the only tip I might add. But just wash your hands frequently. And we did manage to score. My daughter just, I don't know, through mail order, Amazon or whatever, she did manage to just score four bottles of um, sanitizer. Right. So we're, we're good with that. We're using that. Yeah, I think that that the demand for that has slowed a little bit. People aren't hoard, hoarding it anymore. That was the, the issue, is that people were going in and buying yeah. 45 bottles of it at a time. Yeah. Because now, as I sit here in Toronto, um, if I do leave the house, I can go walk around and find all the toilet paper and Purell and all that other stuff that was missing for so long. We keep putting toilet paper on our orders. We haven't gotten any yet. So. Really? Yeah. Well, I, I can send you some from, from Toronto. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, you win the prize for the most beautiful backdrop so far. On the <laughs> the web series. Daughter, she took the photo. It's great. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. We'll talk thank to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Well, that was Kathy Reichs. You can find her book, A Conspiracy of Bones, wherever you buy fine books. Also, look for her virtual book tour to come to a computer screen near you. She's recently done online readings and Q&As in Calgary and Kitchener, and there are plans to schedule many more. My thanks to Kathy for joining us today, but as always, my biggest thanks goes to you. I'm happy you chose to spend some time with us today, and I hope that you're staying healthy, you're staying happy, and you're staying home. We'll talk again soon.